Welcome to the Open Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Hi, Mom. So much fun. I love your Christmas Hi. tree behind you. <laughs> Thank it's you. End of the holiday season. Well, we know a lot of you are, you know, have trepidation about the holiday season, and grief can upend your holiday. And we want to talk to you about that and, and give you some tips and thoughts and ideas ideas today. Well, I'm sure you know about wonderful, compassionate friends because uh, there are 600 chapters in the United States and Debbie's the fabulous executive director. Heidi's on the board. And I hope a lot of you went to the candle lighting last night. We did light a candle at exactly seven o'clock at our house nice. and uh, had our own little memory. And you know what we did this year, which was kind of sweet. We, my husband and I were there alone and we both told a couple of memories of Scott. That's kind of what we did too. You know, it doesn't have to be something fancy or anything. And in fact, this year for the very first time, Compassionate Friends did a virtual candle lighting. So even if you didn't have a chance to participate in the worldwide candle lighting, you can still go on the website and watch the virtual candle lighting. It's kind of nice just to get yeah. that pause in the holiday time. Yes, especially, and we'll get to it if you're going out for other events, because there are a lot of issues related to that. Well, um, let's talk about some of the things you could do about the holiday. I, I wondered, Debbie, how long has it been for you? And there's your sweet son. Yes, that's my Tony. Uh, Tony drowned in March of 2011. So for me, it's really not been all that long that I've been on this journey. So, you know, I love helping others. And I found that it's really healing to help others as well. So, you know, people say I help them, but really, they help me just as much or more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's been seven years. Is that right? Did you say? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. And there, there I am. I can tell it's been a few years for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's Scott. He loved Christmas. That's another thing. You know, how your family felt about Christmas before the holidays. Scott was a great lover. And there he is opening. And he loved cookies. And you can see we've got a good plate. I just love the fact that Tony and Scott are both with their Christmas presents. Yes. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is bittersweet because they're, they're there and such great memories. And yet they're, they're not physically here. So it makes holidays hard, I think. It does. Uh, yeah, it they does. are. We're, we're going to give you some tips and ideas right now. So let's start with the first one. Scale back your expectations. Uh, Debbie, you want to take that on? Sure. You know, it's a common question that we get in Compassionate Friends. What do I do? You know, my mother-in-law always has Christmas dinner. And, you know, it's an expectation that our whole family come, but I just don't feel like being around other people. So, you know, there's all kinds of situations like this. And there's, you know, a number of strategies that you can use, but, you know, you've got to cut down for what you feel comfortable with. And remember, this is your grief journey. So, you know, don't let people put those expectations on you. And you can always say, I will try, but I can't promise. So give yourself an out before you ever you know, commit to anything. I will try, but I may not feel like it right at that moment. Well, you can scale back your expectations. I agree with that. And I like the idea of I will try, but I can't promise anything. But unfortunately, parents that have surviving children at home oftentimes need to, need to put on their game face and they need to, uh, you know, step up and, and do, the, and do the, the whole holiday thing because kids really, really want it especially after a loss they even want it more because things have been so sad and you know oftentimes if kids will say to me you know i feel like sometimes i'm not enough because my parents are so sad that i'm not enough for them so yes. I, it's hard though because sometimes you gotta fake it yep well i was just thinking you know that big plate of cookies we saw there by scott buy them i mean some of those things that maybe you felt like you two had traditionally you have to do buy it uh, yes buy it. We already cooked turkey you know, buy, buy some of those things or ask people to uh, bring them in. I think also take a break, um, you know, just 15 minutes of going up into your room and closing the door and laying on the bed can really be rejuvenating. So, 
you know, try to take yeah. some of the little breaks for yourself during the holidays. And I think sometimes you need that because sometimes you become so overwhelmed with grief that you kind of need to step back because certain things trigger us during the holidays, certain memories. Mm -hmm. well, yes, let's and you know, it's important, I think, to have kind of a buddy uh, wherever you're at someone, it doesn't necessarily have to be the host or the hostess, but just someone that you let them know, hey, you know, if you don't see me, it's okay. I just needed to step away so that, you know, everybody's concerned about you and they're wondering, uh oh, where'd Debbie go? Is she okay? You know, and that buddy system, you've got somebody that can say, no, she's fine. I know she just needed a few minutes to step away. So allow yourself to do that. But at the same time, you've got to let people know that, you know, you're going to be okay. So buddy up with someone. And so this that can. brings me into another point about that. Buddy your kids up. If yes. You little kids, have a friend. But ask one. Maybe uh, your child loves uh, your nephew. Ask your nephew. Boys love that kind of thing. If they take your child out to either play, do ice skating, and shoot some hoops, or maybe to buy a present. Mary says, my husband died two years ago. I wanted to do a full-blown Christmas and change tradition. I'm getting a lot of flack from my in-laws. They want me to stick with the same pattern. Wow. With the in-laws. Hmm. And they want her to stick with the same pattern, but she, Mary wants to do a full-blown Christmas. Debbie, have you got any thoughts? It's been a couple of years since dad died, her husband. Yeah, you know, I do. And again, it really goes back to our last slide about expectations. Obviously, the in-laws have expectations. And Communication is very important. So you do what you need to do to get through this grief journey. And if you want to have a full blown Christmas, then you just have to communicate that. And you have to say, you know, I understand you'd like to keep things the same, but I really need to do this. So I'm going to go forward. And then that way, by laying out that framework, then they know what to expect. So I think you have to do what feels right to you. Well, and sometimes your, your new holiday tradition may be honoring the person that died. I like the idea of honoring your child or your sibling or your grandchild or your you know, spouse or whoever has died. But, uh, the idea of like, you know, there's a wreath right here. So some people will get a wreath and then they'll put all the things that, like I would put all the things that Scott loved. He loved the New York Jets. He loved Twix bars. He loved, you know, cinnamon gum. And you go out and buy them and then you decorate the wreath with them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one suggestion, but just ways, you know, toasting them, ways, things that you can do to bring them in the room and honor their memory, mm -hmm. um, I think are really important. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, uh, if you do something in their name that you can leave around, like the candle with their name on it or what, they're kind of there and part of the tradition and you don't have to, you know, they're just a presence. So way to make them exactly. a presence. Do you have any thoughts on that, Debbie? Yeah, you know, a lot of people will, they'll, you know, they find, again, helping others is healing. So in order to honor their child or, you know, whether it be a husband or a grandchild or a brother or sister, they may go to uh, like on Christmas Day and serve a dinner at the Salvation Army in honor of their child. So you don't have to keep the same traditions and you can do the things that you, it just makes you feel good. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the holidays, when we were young, the biggest part was the surprise of getting a present. I mean, when you're small, it's like, that's the fun. But really, as we grow a bit older and mature, really the fun is in giving. So I think it's a way just to find a way to give in honor of your child. Maybe it's uh, taking, if you've lost a young child, uh, take some toys that they would have liked. Go ahead and, and shop for them and take them to a homeless shelter. Uh, so it, it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. Uh, you know, as you said, just lighting a candle. Uh, we always do that. So Tony's, we know his light is always shining right there with us. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, let's talk about focusing on your favorite things, because I think it's important to decide, maybe you can even make a little list for yourself this year. It doesn't have to be long. 
what is the favorite part of Christmas for you that you, it, it would be important for you and, and sad if you didn't do it? And, and, and then you can cut out some of the things that aren't as, as favorable that you don't like. Well, you know, for me, I think it's kind of like when you think in terms of Thanksgiving dinner, uh, you know, going around and asking all of those that are going to be maybe in your inner circle and saying, what is your favorite part? So that, you know, you have an idea of, oh, they always like the toast that we give or someone else that just might be, I like where we light the candle together. Uh, so I think it's, again, communicating with each other everyone that's going to take part in your celebration, whatever that celebration might be, so that you're as inclusive as possible and trying to touch base on all of the things that are important to each other and maybe not doing everything. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We have a big uh, Christmas Eve dinner usually. And uh, Heidi, um, if she's around, has the idea of a toast. How do you talk about the toast a little bit? Uh. Well, from a sibling perspective, I always like to speak for the siblings. And we often feel forgotten, unacknowledged, and minimized in our loss, and just kind of invisible. Um, so I always say when you give a toast to people that have died, like when you give a toast to Scott, include your living children as well as the children that have died. Yes. So in other words, say things like, okay, this, this, you know, toast is, this is for Scott. Got my little water. This toast is for Scott and to remember him. And it's also for Heather, Rebecca, and Heidi. And I'm so glad that they're here with us. Mm -hmm. um, so bring in all your children, not just those that are, that are not, no longer here. Yeah, when we celebrated our toast at uh, Thanksgiving this year, we to toasted Heidi's son, Alexander, who's in Afghanistan. So, and he'll be there at Christmas too, so we'll have to figure out some little rituals that we can do to remember him. Laura says, my son passed away by suicide last December. Is it okay to skip the holiday family events altogether? And, you know, I'll start out with that because your grief journey is your journey. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you what my husband and I did. Uh, initially, we tried to go around the grief. And, and so we didn't do a celebration hardly at all at the holidays. Uh, and we went somewhere. But what we found was when we came back, that darn grief was still there. We hadn't really escaped anything. And in fact, it went with us. Uh, but you really have to kind of do what feels right. And there really is a, you should do this or you should do that. You have to do what's right for you and let everyone know what you're going to do. That's right for you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, our first Christmas, um, I happened to have been a therapist at the time. And one of the therapeutic things that they always said was you should do the same ritual you should go through the same thing that first year because you're going to have to unpack the boxes later uh go through and do christmas so i don't know if heidi probably didn't even know that that's why we did christmas in fact we just i just tried to do it the say exactly the same way and i i'm i'm sure i cut back on things you know you're in a fog and yeah. uh, but, um, but we went through that, and we actually did that for two years. And then on the third year, uh, we left and went to Hawaii and, and didn't do anything. And, and I, but that's just our pattern of what we did. Everybody needs to do it their own way. But as Debbie said, and I'm saying, it is tough to open those boxes and things. Heidi, have you got mm -hmm. anything on that? Um, I loved going to Hawaii. It was such a relief to get away. And I think one of the hardest things is unpacking the Christmas bulbs for those that celebrate Christmas because some of them have my brother's name on them and they were his Christmas bulbs and he used to hang them. And it was really, really painful to unpack those boxes and have him not there doing it, doing, you know, helping us. Yep. So we had support people. We had some people that did a secret Santa for us. We, I mean, you'll find some people that you didn't know will come in and support you, but Anyway, on the, the uh, suicide thing, I mean, you are just going to have to do what you want to do. And I hope you're going to Compassionate Friends or a support group or a therapist. 
if you haven't done that, you might want to consider getting that kind of support or maybe you have a pastor or somebody. Because, and I'm glad you mentioned it to us. Uh, my heart goes out to you that, uh, that about the suicide and being Christmas. Absolutely. And, and you know, mom, you said people will be there for you. If they're not, ask them to be there. Yeah. Because sometimes people don't know what kind of grief support we need. We expect them to be psychic. So tell, bring people, more people in. Debbie's nodding, so I know she's resonating with this, right? right? Yes, absolutely. You know, people, they really don't know how to help us. And sometimes, you know, they say some things that you think, why in the world would they have said that? Yeah. And, and what I really try hard to do is listen to their intent and know that they're really trying to help me. Uh, and there's also online resources, you know, when Gloria was talking about, you know, going to a therapist, going to a group, going to compassionate friends, do all of the above till you find what fits and resonates with you. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's online resources as well. So if you don't feel like getting out of your pajamas, stay in them and, you know, go online and find others that are waiting to reach their hand back to you to help you along this journey. Absolutely, and and we're not saying it's not a tough year. Oh Christmas, gosh, the yeah. first Christmas is really tough, and you do have to remember it's just one day and all those things that feel like cliches or whatever. But it, you know, you just have to uh, get through it. It's rough, so yeah, we appreciate that. So do some things on your own. Let me say one thing about this. I always say, if you do things with everybody all the time, do some things on your own. If you're a loner and never do anything with anybody, this is a pretty hard, grief and loss is a hard burden to carry on your own. I think that you do need downtime. So I guess that would be what I would consider being doing things on my own. You do need time to kind of, you know, regroup and to yourself and not to have to be on. Because sometimes you feel like, okay, I have to be on. I have to put on my game face and I don't feel like it. I'm, I'm a mess, so I think it's good to kind of step back and get some time by yourself. Yeah, and you know, grief is really hard work. You, a lot of people don't think of it as work, but it is hard work, and so you have to kind of work through it. You have to do some of those things on your own mm -hmm. uh, to, to build that self-confidence again, because what happened with me was my confidence, I just lost it because my world as your world shattered, mm -hmm. and I was like, I had to figure things out again. So to me, doing some things on your own is, is pushing myself just a little bit. I don't have to push a lot but to gain that self-confidence again in my world that yeah. I do have some control over things. Mm -hmm. I, I like that, Debbie, because it's so strange being the bereaved family. <laughs> you know, you always think it's going to be every, you always see other people in that situation. And then all of a sudden it's you and you're like, wow, yes. now I'm that person. Mm -hmm. So we've got another question from Polly. She says, when sending Christmas cards to someone that has lost a child, is it okay to mention their loss and what's appropriate? Any suggestions? Yeah. Maybe you're a good writer. What do you do? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Please mention their loss. Let them know, you know, what happens sometimes is people like to, I'm not going to bring it up because it will upset them. We're going to be upset anyway. We get more upset if we don't hear their name as if they're forgotten. So, oh my goodness, I am so glad you asked that because I think it's important to acknowledge that we know this is going to be a tough time for you and I'm really sorry. Uh, I don't know what it's like. Don't say I know what it's like. Everyone's grief is different, uh, but I'm there for you. And then be kind of proactive. You know, I'd like to come and take you to coffee. Uh, are you available on the weekend? You know, instead of just saying, uh, is there any, if there's anything you need, just let me know. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I, let you know. I remember a, a doctor of ours went to the line at the viewing and he said, call me in a couple of months when you're feeling better. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to call you. I don't think I'm going to call you. You know, yeah. you, know you, you have to call some people and sometimes you have to call them pretty regularly before, you know, before they kind of feel comfortable. I love texting. I've been texting my yes. friend who's been died uh, a few months ago. And you, yeah. you can just say, texting is great because you can say hi thinking of you. Yes, uh -huh. yes, I agree. 
And, yeah. you know, initially for me, it was, you know, every, it, Tony died on a Wednesday. So it was every Wednesday. It's another Wednesday. Eventually that went away. But then it was always the second, the second of every month. You know, it's like it's the second again. And, and so, you know, there are those things that we just keep kind of playing mm -hmm. over in our minds. So yes, please mention their name. And if you have a favorite story or a memory, share that as well. I love that. That's a great gift to give to somebody, sharing that a story or yes. memory. Really is. Mm -hmm. that is. That is a wonderful idea to share a memory. I know a lot of people have been doing that on Facebook uh, mm -hmm. for Scott after all these years. So, you know, and the holidays bring up a time. And you could ask people if you want to say, um, it, it's the holiday time coming around. Do you have any memories of mom or dad or my son or whoever that, uh, that I could share with our family this year? Mm -hmm. You know, and it doesn't matter how long it's been. Really yeah. putting them together and breathing. I'm going to start with breathing because I, actually my friend's son who just died, the first thing I talked to her on the phone and the first thing I, uh, I said to her in text, I didn't say it on the phone. I said, Please take five breaths for me this today. Five deep breaths. Because people don't realize that when you have had a loss, you breathe in the upper chest, and that's the fight or flight sympathetic. You don't get down into the gut, which is the parasympathetic, which they call repose and repair, which is how you relax after you eat. So it's important to remember breathing. Heidi, why don't you take gratitude? Well, the research shows that gratitude is the number one quickest way to change how we feel. But it's really hard, I think, after a loss, because you, you ask people about gratitude and they kind of get irritated. It's like there's nothing to be grateful for. Tony's dead, Scott's dead. What is there to be grateful for? So it's, sometimes you have to kind of get further away, but uh, even little things in life. I mean, I'm grateful for the fact that Scott was in my life for 17 and a half years initially you might just be grateful that your lights work you know i mean it might be and it might have to be little things grateful for some of the people that are still in your life and as you focus on the gratitude it'll start to grow and you'll start to see more and more things in your life that you're grateful for right and and they really the breathing and the gratitude they change brain chemistry. You know, at, when you're later on in this journey, you won't see it right away, but there really are some gifts in grief. Uh, and as Heidi said, you know, she had Scott for 17 and a half years. I had Tony for 29. But mm -hmm. there are other types of gifts of grief. Like I got to met, meet these two wonderful ladies that are so strong. And, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise I'd have never met them. Now, don't get me wrong. I would take Tony back in a second and forget them forever. But, yeah. you know, kind of try to think, okay, what are the gifts? But don't push yourself to do that because it takes time to get there. Mm -hmm. And then sleep for me, sleep was off and on. Sometimes that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to stay in bed. I didn't want to move and I would just sleep off and on. And then sometimes I couldn't shut my mind down. And so I had trouble trying to sleep. So what I would do is I tried to find activities. And, and I, for example, am not a jigsaw puzzle person. But what I found was I could rest my mind mm. by trying to put together the pieces of a puzzle where instead of my mind racing, which was keeping me from sleeping, I could rest my mind mind. And by doing something like that right before bed, it was easier for me to rest and to get some sleep. Debbie, I love that idea of doing a puzzle. Mm -hmm. That's a really great idea. Staying yeah. off of the electronics at night. Yes. Green. Yes. Don't take your iPad to bed. Well, and I think electronics are also difficult because after you've had a loss, you go onto Facebook and Instagram and see everybody's families. And yes. So see all these people that have never had a loss and it's hard. And, and I used to get jealous of people that still had a brother. I was yeah. like, wait a minute, my brother loved his life and I love being with them. And why, why did this happen to me? So, or how about those Christmas letters that you got? It's like, mm -hmm. la, 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 their life is perfect. And mine yeah. is not, exactly. you know, yeah, yeah. It's, really it's, hard. it's hard. It's hard. It's hard not to compare. It is. It is. 
Well, and, and uh, as our friend Jed Black said about sleep, if you go on our site to um, and Google Jed Black's radio show, he was an expert at Stanford on sleep. And one of the things he says is don't have a glass of wine before you go to bed. You might think it's relaxing, but you'll wake up at one o'clock in the morning, which is a, an interesting thought. But he also said that you wake up seven times a night, adults do. And wow. so just know that you're going to. So now when I wake up, I just am kind of like going back to sleep. Right, Heidi? Yeah, I just realized that you can still be well rested and wake up, I think, seven to 10 times a night. That's what adults do normally. Yeah. And so it does take the edge off of things. When you wake up, you say, okay, this is one, this is number one, and this is okay. I'll still be well rested instead of getting yourself in a frenzy when you wake up. We're down to number seven is exercise, but if you don't do some exercise, you're obviously going to have trouble sleeping. You really have to find, in my opinion, that person that really kind of gets it. Uh, I've I have a husband of 43 years. I've never, you know, been without him, so I can't really help someone that's lost a spouse. I can certainly sympathize with them. But having lost a child, I can really talk to someone and say, oh, I get it. Yes, I thought I was going crazy. No, I did that too. So it's trying to make those social connections, not only with the people that get it, but also with the people that don't uh, to say, you know, it's been really tough. And thanks for asking about Tony. Uh, you know, just kind of letting people know, don't become a recluse, if at all possible, because you've got to get out there and do, you know, stretch a bit and, and make yourself move forward through the grief. Well, and I think if you don't connect and if you get isolated, you start to think that what you're going through is not normal. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's something wrong with you and that you're going crazy and that you're not doing it right. And there's not a right and wrong way to do it. And I think the more you can get around people that have had a shared experience, the more you're like, okay, you know what? This is the way it looks. I'm fine. It's, gonna, it's going to be okay eventually. And, and it's strange how sometimes uh, things happen that people appear and say something that is, is life-changing to you. It's mm -hmm. odd. I, I had someone get in touch with me um, who was in our Compassionate Friends group and it, it was her two year anniversary and she is a school teacher and very confident. She got in touch with me on the phone and said, Gloria, I think I'm going crazy. Mm -hmm. And so we met and I said, that, that's not unusual during the second year. It sounds like you're getting worse, but you're getting better because you're thawing out and you're realizing that this is life and you're, you can take in more. So talking to me, I've been there, I could say that. You know, and if, you know, it's not something I've experienced because there's such a vast network in Compassionate Friends for uh, the loss of a child, a grandchild, a brother or a sister. We may not know, I may not know someone personally, that I can put you in touch with someone that has a very similar situation uh, that you can talk to and, you know, just, you know, run by them. You know, is this, am I doing okay? Am I doing the right thing? Just to talk it out. We've got like 26 closed Facebook pages now. So we have things like for men only. So the only people on that closed page are men where they can feel like they can really express themselves. We have one just for siblings, one just for grandparents. We've got them for the type of loss, for the age of your child, grandchild, brother or sister. So lots of resources there. I think the great thing about exercise is that you don't have to do a lot of it to get benefits. So if you walk, I think it's what, three or four times a week, 20 to 30 minutes, that can profoundly change your life. And you know, grief and gets trapped in our bodies. It's very traumatic to have a family member die. So it gets trapped in our bodies and we need to move our bodies to, to move through that, you know, to get the grief out. And uh, so just walking is very beneficial. Mm -hmm. I just think we forget that grief is not just a, a mental experience. It's yeah. yes. it your whole body, your whole, your whole system, your cardiovascular, 
you know, all, all those kinds of uh, things. Gloria, that's exactly what I was going to say is that, you know, we think grief is all in our heads and it's really, it encompasses our entire bodies. And that's yeah. why sometimes people will get ill more easily afterwards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, getting up and moving, it refreshes your mind and it, and it works things out through your system. So even if it, you don't have to do a lot, you don't have to run a marathon, but just mm -hmm. get up and walk a little bit yeah and I always say if, if people are into restorative yoga it is really incredible and you will feel like you're not doing anything you will sit there and let you lay down on blankets I mean it's it's that's all you and they move you in different places and you have pillows and blankets under you and you will feel very different afterwards because it's moving the, the grief in your body Mm -hmm. We have some wonderful uh, television shows that you can go on Open to Hope and uh, access with Bessel van der Kolp. He wrote a book called The Body Keeps Score, and we did three shows with him. And he talked on there about how yoga, actually they've done a study that shows that it's more effective than antidepressants. You know, when we do workshops, we always give people quizzes about how often they think on average babies laugh a day. And on average, babies laugh 350 times a day. Wow. <laughs> I know, right? In contrast, adults laugh about 20 to 25 times a day. So laughter is an emotion, and it's, it's, it's similar to crying. I mean, it's a way to get emotion out. It's a very positive way. I would encourage people to do it. I think what gets in the way is we feel guilty when we laugh. We feel like, oh, Heidi didn't love her brother. She wouldn't be laughing. So we feel disloyal, but laughing is a way to grieve. Mm -hmm. I, find, way to grieve. I found that right after Scott died, maybe for 10 days when there were people around, we kind of had this dark humor. We actually laughed a fair amount and weird mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, that's, that's why it's good to get around people that are going through the shared experience because otherwise people are like, what? that's not funny. <laughs> it's, not, it's not funny that you couldn't close his casket because he had it. So you put so many of his things in there. I mean, you know, they, people don't, that have not been through the experience don't understand. It's a way for you to cope. It's a way for you to get out the emotion. I know one of our uh, chapter members was saying that she kept her dad's ashes in her van under the seat. And uh, uh, she was talking to her friend about, oh, my dad's in the van. And they were all kind of laughing about it. Well, somebody there from the police department or whatever heard them or somebody oh, no. knew. And they called her at her home and said, we understand that your father's living in the van. <laughs> it's against the ordinance. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Well, you know, we're in the middle of a move and I'll just share a brief funny story. So the Packers are there and, you know, they work very quickly when they go through your house. It's like you can't keep up. And I had forgotten. I, Tony was cremated and I keep him in my office with me on a shelf. He's always there. And I had forgotten, oh my gosh, I've got to go get Tony. And so I ran in there afraid that they'd packed him and they hadn't. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. I said, will you hand me my son? And <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. I said, my son's remains are on that second shelf. I can't quite oh read them. And so then what's funnier is then we put him on the kitchen counter. And then the packer uh, working the kitchen, my husband's in there, you know, keeping an eye on things. And, and he says, and, and do you want this box packed? And my husband says, no, that's my son. And then the packer says, oh, I'll take very good care of him. My husband says, no, he's riding in the car with us. So, Oh, my gosh, I love it. And people that have been through this get it. They get that. Yeah. They understand yeah. the importance of, of that. And it, that's your, you know, calling him your son and how important the urn is and all that. I mean, we get it. Yes. Uh -huh. You know, uh, we know that, la that laughter not only causes you to breathe, because think about it, when you laugh, you have to breathe in deeply. But we also know that it actually, it promotes more dopamine in the brain. Mm -hmm. So, and how do you talk about smile and your brain will think you're happy, right? Yes, it's actually been shown with the research. If we smile, and a lot of times if you put a pen in your mouth and smile for 60 seconds, it makes you smile bigger than you would without it. Okay? <laughs> and for all of you watching, you can smile really big. Even if you don't feel like smiling, and even if you're not happy, it will tell your brain, I am happy right now. I am happy because these are muscles that are going up. 
So it's, it's interesting. In fact, they've also shown that Botox helps people with depression because all of oh. a sudden you have, you have a permanent smile on your face. <laughs> another reason. Okay. <laughs> and another thing uh, Bessel van der Kolk uh, told us when he was on our show is that he himself, son, was very depressed. Mm -hmm. And he started doing improv. And it mm -hmm. changed his whole life. Art Sumner, Healing Improv, does a wonderful job of, you know, you, you get in a group and you think, uh, what's this going to be? And you were laughing by the end of the session. It's wonderful. I love it. And then there's yoga laughter. There are all sorts of things to think about from that. Well, let's talk about focusing on the positive. I think initially it's difficult, but I think we have to force ourselves to go into those places or we're going to get really, really low and have a hard time coming out. So I always say to people, um, think about all the negativity you're giving yourself. We feed ourselves a lot of negative stuff and try to balance it a little bit. Try to force yourself to, to think about some positive things in your life, even though it could be difficult so that you can create, you know, the more that we do that, like, again, the more that we feel better, we feel better when we do that. It's hard you know, to do. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things that I find hard in grief and loss, Debbie, and I'd love you to comment on this, is uh, for, fam for people who are together, I'll say my husband and I, because I have a husband, uh, and w after our son died, there would be days when I would get up and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to really get it going today, okay? I'm going to focus on the positive, and I'm, I'm going to really get it going. And, and, uh, and he, I see him, and he says, I've had it today. I'm exhausted. I can't go through this anymore. I can't stand going to work. I frankly kind of resented it sometime. And I'm sure he resented me when he was trying to pull it together too. What's your thought, Debbie? Yeah, you know, it, it is when you've got a partner, uh, it's difficult. You're lucky if when they're down, you're up. Uh, it's really bad when you're both down. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is difficult when, uh, you know, you see the other one perhaps going on with normal, regular, what appears to be, you know, fine routines, and, and you're not able to even get dressed. So it's kind of like, how can you do this? I can't do that. So, and, and I think the important part of that is you can't compare yourself to anyone. Uh, you know, whether it's been your life partner for 40, 50 years, you're still going to grieve differently and uniquely from each other. Mm -hmm. Heidi, how about being in college or at school and people expecting you to be positive after? Well, yeah, I think that's really, really hard. I mean, I was in college when Scott died and I was 20. And I think that there's an expectation by other 20 year olds. First of all, most 20 year olds have never lost a brother or sister. They don't even understand what that is. And I, it, there's very little tolerance for you not being fun. So you get about two weeks to grieve and then they want you to be over it and yeah. move forward and act like a 20 year old, act like a fun 20 year old. So that's very, that's very, very difficult, especially if they didn't know the person that died. If you're in a space like I was where nobody knew Scott, um, it was really hard for me because there wasn't a lot of support from my friends. Yeah. So during this holiday season, uh, people are doing more parties and more happy and more this and more yeah. that. So, uh, sometimes it may be difficult and self, self care is really important. Well, let's talk about hugs, hugs. Love them. Yes. <laughs> uh, 20 seconds a day is what you should be getting as far as hugs. And the best part about it is you don't need to hug somebody else to get the benefits. You can hug yourself. Just like babies, follow their arms yeah. and rock. <laughs> so you can do it right now, everybody. But maybe as part of your Christmas gift from somebody you love, maybe even one of your kids or somebody, ask them for somebody hugs or give that as a gift to a bereaved person in your family. Yes, you know, I think the touch is very important. My husband and I, we, our goal is eight hugs a day. And that probably, that. yeah, that probably comes out. And sometimes we're like, Hey, it's six o'clock. We've only had three hugs. And it's like, okay, here's another. One. Okay, here's another one. <laughs> but it does help. It really does, it does. To, to hug each other. And your husband's a big bear of a hugger, I think. He is. He gives great <laughs> hugs. And, and, and he loves to give hugs. <laughs> and Debbie, have you ever noticed that oftentimes when we hug, we smile? Yes, absolutely. It's like absolutely. I'm just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden you find yourself smiling. It's like, oh, I'm smiling too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a, a question from somebody, mom. Oh, okay. Um, it's from, she, mail, she mail, emailed it. It's from Shauna. And she said her mother died February of last year and her father died four years ago. So she's lost both of her parents. Yeah. She said, I have children who I'm trying to hold it together for. Her husband is a great support, but he's never had the death of a parent. Mm -hmm. um, she said both of her parents really love Christmas and she wants to know any suggestions to help her get through the holidays without her parents. Well, first of all, I want to say that our website, the number one visit we have, and we have millions of people visiting our site, is parent loss, adults losing parents. I think parent loss is a very unrecognized loss for people. Uh, even a 90 year old parent, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a huge loss. So, well, well, mom, we've never known, we've never known our, our worlds without our parents in them. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's huge. When your parents and it's died. a, it's a marginalized loss too, yeah. because oftentimes people will say to you, Oh, they had such a full life. Mm -hmm. They lived so many years, you know, that's like saying, Oh, you shouldn't be sad. Right. And yeah. it's like, no, that, that, you can't marginalize it like that. I agree, Debbie. You need to figure out how to take those breaks for yourself while still doing whatever these, these good things are. I would say you need to pick out the things that are most important for you personally to have in Christmas. If there are other things that aren't as important, you can ask your kids. I don't know how old they are. If it's important to them, they can do it. You can ask a relative, you know, maybe yeah, a family gathering of what's important at Christmas. I think if things are too painful, you can just stop doing them. Yeah. And I think it's important to, to talk to the children as well. Mm -hmm. Like when we were lighting our candles last night for Tony, I was explaining to my grandchildren that are eight, nine, 10 mm -hmm. and 12 that, you know, grandma's sad and I have tears, but it doesn't mean that I'm not okay. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I miss your Uncle Tony. And then I equated it, you know, to carrying a, a backpack and how sometimes I don't feel it. Other times it's like, I, I don't know if I can walk anymore. And, and that it's okay. It's okay for grandma to cry. And it's okay for me to miss him because I loved him so much. So I think opening up to your children depend, of course, on their ages, but letting them know that just because you're sad doesn't mean that you're not okay or that you're not going to be okay. I think that that's really important for kids to hear because at the end of the day, they're terrified yeah. that their parents are not, are not going to be able to take care of them and that they're not going to be okay long-term. So I love that just to re, you know, reassure them. Well, Debbie and Heidi, it's been a great show today, and I hope we've given a lot of uh, good advice for those folks out there. May you have a healing holiday season. We will never forget our loved ones, as they will always be in our hearts. The holidays are a time that our memories will continue to connect us with those who have made us who we are today. Thank you. And Debbie, have a wonderful holiday. You too, both of you. Thank you, everyone, for watching and for being there for each other. Absolutely. Heidi, did you want to say something? Yes, I just want to thank everybody. And please don't be too hard on yourself. Yes. Don't judge your grief. Just be there with it um, and know that you're not alone. Uh -huh. And Laura sends us our final note, which is very touching, Laura. She says, thank you so much, ladies. I am so glad you found us. <laughs> oh, I love that. And thanks everyone and have a safe and a comfortable holiday and please take care of yourself as you're the most important person because people are looking to you to see how they should behave and seeing that you can deal with it, can talk about it, can cry, can do whatever you need to do is I think an inspiration for everyone. And Debbie and Heidi, and I want to remind you always that if you've lost hope this holiday season, please lean on ours until you find your own. And God bless.